This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. Welcome back to the GSMC Sports Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Alex Masper. Thank you so much for tuning into today's episode and to be continuing to listen to the show. If you are a returning listener, we really do appreciate you. Before I start talking anything sports, I want to remind you all of a couple of things. First, please, please, please subscribe to the podcast on whatever podcasting app or website you are listening to this on. To do that, you can just go to our homepage and hit the subscribe button. If you're on you know, Apple Podcasts, it'll be in the top right-hand corner with next to that plus sign that says subscribe. You want to subscribe to the podcast for a couple of reasons, but the main one being you get those alerts and those notifications on your phone, on your laptop, on your watch, on whatever you may be listening to this episode on. And you can always know when we drop a new episode of the GSMC Sports Podcast here at the GSMC Podcast Network. Again, please, please, please subscribe to the podcast so you can get those alerts and notifications and that way you can never miss an episode and be one of the first people to listen to a new episode when we release it again please 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 subscribe to the podcast we'd also really appreciate it if you could leave us a five-star review or just a positive review on that same podcasting app or website on that same device uh, just to give us a boost of confidence to let us know that you guys are enjoying the content and discussion points and the structure of the show and if you are again we would really appreciate it if you leave us a five-star review or just a positive review in general uh, on that same apple Podcasts or spotify or podbean whatever you might be listening to this on again same thing just go to the home page and click leave a review that would give us a uh, big boost of confidence again it would let us know that you guys are enjoying the structure of the show and everything about it so that would be awesome if you could and finally if you could follow us on all social media platforms twitter facebook and instagram is where you can primarily follow us Over there, we can interact and pretty much talk about anything over on social media. We can talk about sports. We can talk about life. We can do some live tweeting of some big-time hockey games or baseball games when the season starts. Whatever it may be, all of those interaction needs can be found on social media. So, again, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram is where you can primarily follow us, and we would love if you could do so. Uh, I hope wherever you are and however you may be listening, you and your family are happy and healthy during these extremely trying times in the world today. We have a fantastic show for you all today. Coming up later on in the episode, I promise I will get to as many draft picks throughout the entire NFL draft as I can. Of course, I'll get to all of the quarterbacks. Justin Fields going to the Bears. Mac Jones going to the Patriots, not the 49ers. And with that third overall pick, the 49ers ended up picking Trey Lance. I will break down all three of those picks as well as a little bit about Zach Wilson to the Jets. Uh, I might get to Trevor Lawrence and the Jags, but I think we've talked about that a lot. I think it's going to work. Uh, but we'll get to all of those quarterback picks. I will also try to break down some of my favorite drafts as a collective unit by some teams. I really like the New York Jets draft. I really like the Miami Dolphins draft. Uh, I'll break down those two drafts as well as a couple of other ones that I think were really excellent. Not just in the first round, but rounds two through seven, I thought. They got multiple starters, multiple high players. And uh, we'll break all that stuff down coming up later on in the episode as well. But we're going to start off with the shell-shocking NFL news that kicked off NFL Draft Weekend that came out on Thursday, just hours before round one of the NFL Draft was supposed to start. Aaron Rodgers has told members of the Green Bay Packers organization, including some teammates, that he does not want to play for the Green Bay Packers anymore and that he will not be returning next season Now, this was absolutely groundbreaking news that came out about, I think, what, a couple of hours before the draft. Uh, Adam Schefter said that he was going to break some news on NFL Live. I went right to my television, expecting it to honestly be Tim Tebow news. Uh, About, whatever, an hour before the Aaron Rodgers news came out, there was a rumor that the Jacksonville Jaguars might be signing Tim Tebow to play that Taysom Hill-type tight end, quarterback, running back, trick play 
uh, role for the team. So I honestly thought Adam Schefter was going to be announcing that Tim Tebow was back in the NFL, so I was excited to see it. But instead he dropped this absolute bombshell of Aaron Rodgers news. And Green Bay has been adamant since this news came out that Aaron's not going to be traded. We're not moving the MVP, our Super Bowl champion, arguably the greatest quarterback in our franchise history. We're not going to be moving him. But Aaron has been adamant in telling teammates, telling people around the NFL that he's not coming back. I've heard some reports that retirement is an option if he can't get his way. Uh, I've heard some reports that he told teammates that he's not coming back and it's set in stone. Trey Wingo came out and said that Aaron was under the impersonation that the night before the draft he was supposed to be traded to San Francisco. Things fell through there. San Francisco kept the pick, picked Trey Lance. They're now out of the Aaron Rodgers sweepstakes. Now, there haven't been a concrete list of teams that Aaron has given Green Bay as that he wants to go to, but multiple reports have indicated, while that list is in public, some of the teams that have been mentioned are obviously the San Francisco 49ers, but that seems unlikely because of the Trey Lance pick. The Las Vegas Raiders with John Gruden, the Denver Broncos with Vic Vangio uh, in that loaded roster, and the Miami Dolphins, uh, according to, I think, Benjamin Albright, he put out that list. Uh, I think it was him. Pro Football Network also mentioned a similar list to that. Uh, For sure, we've seen that the Raiders and the Broncos have been teams that have been already engaging with Green Bay uh, on a potential trade. Again, Green Bay has said we're not trading him up until this point. Hasn't really accepted those phone calls yet. But it seems that Aaron wants to go to the West Coast or a team potentially like the Miami Dolphins. I want to break down all three of these fits and also what I believe Green Bay should be doing going forward so let's get into that so it appears that there are really two people involved in this dispute the general manager of the green bay packers brian uh, gutekust is i think how you say his name and aaron Rodgers. now i'm gonna side with aaron on this i said about a little under a year ago after last year's draft when the packers drafted jordan love i said aaron Rodgers was going to be the packer quarterback last year but as soon as this season he would not be the Green Bay Packer quarterback anymore. Now, as the season went on and as he won MVP, I thought that Green Bay would go all in on him, maybe commit, and Aaron would not would want to stay. And he would understand that this is probably one of the best situations you can be in in the NFL right now. Devontae Adams is there. One of the better uh, tackles in the left uh, the left tackle, David Bakhtiari, is there. Matt LaFleur seems like a legitimate head coach that knows how to run a real system. Aaron just won an MVP. He didn't make the Super Bowl, and he didn't win the Super Bowl, but they have that Super Bowl caliber roster. In my opinion, they just did not beat Tampa Bay that day. But um, I want to compare it to a different situation. Back in 2014, I believe it was, Jimmy Garoppolo and Tom Brady were together, in a sense, for the quarterback room for the New England Patriots. Bill Belichick eventually wanted to have Jimmy Garoppolo be the successor to Tom Brady probably sooner than Tom would have liked. Tom went to Robert Kraft and asked, hey, get this guy out of here, and he did it, right? But that relationship wasn't repaired between Tom Brady and the Patriots when Jimmy Garoppolo was traded to the San Francisco 49ers, and we've known this. It was reported by people from ESPN, Sam Wishaker, saying, yep, Brady for years now has been angry with the Patriots, and this was a snowball effect that eventually led to Tom Brady going to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers last offseason. While the Green Bay Packers this offseason did offer Aaron Rodgers that contract extension, essentially saying, yes, we took Jordan Love, but you're our guy. We're not going to play Jordan over you. We're not going to rush you out like maybe we rushed Brett out or New England was trying to rush Brady out or Bill Belichick. We're not going to do that. We wanted to give you this contract extension just to let you know that this is what we're doing going forward. We're going with you. You're the MVP. You're the guy. And Aaron declined the contract extension. And not, I don't think it's because of too much money or anything like that. Or I don't think it's because they didn't do enough to make Aaron happy with weapons or anything like that. I think Aaron is very happy with the current team of the Green Bay Packers. I think he he's very close with Devontae Adams. Very close with Aaron Jones. Very close with a lot of his Packer teammates. Just went to the Derby with uh, some of them, I believe. Uh, like David Bakhtiari, I believe. Uh, so they're close. He, it's not a relationship issue. It's not, uh, I don't like the guys I'm playing with. The roster isn't good enough. I don't even think it's a Matt LaFleur thing. I don't think it's a coaching thing either. I really do believe he likes playing a Matt LaFleur system, being efficient, not turning the ball over, not throwing the ball away, racking up stats, having a nice run game to lean on. Aaron really didn't get hit that much last season either, so that had to be nice. Uh, quarterbacks like Russell Wilson, Andrew Luck took hits for years. Aaron wasn't taking a lot of hits last year. But when you do... 
that. When you draft Jordan Love in the first round, Green Bay had a plan. And that plan started when it was when they drafted Jordan Love. Eventually, Aaron Rodgers was going to not be the Green Bay Packer quarterback, and Jordan Love was going to replace him. There's four years on Jordan Love's contract, not counting the fifth-year option. That means that within four years of you drafting Jordan Love, the Packers had to see, at least in my opinion, one full season of Jordan Love starting for their team in order to decide if they should pick up his fifth-year option or extend him. So at minimum, at minimum, or excuse me, at maximum, Aaron Rodgers was going to be the Green Bay quarterback for the next three seasons. That is what the Green Bay Packer plan was. And if you're Aaron Rodgers, you feel disrespected by that. You're giving me a three-year timetable with this team after I have won a Super Bowl for you, won multiple MVPs, carried terrible offenses, arguably carried bad coaches like Mike McCarthy and coaches in the past for Green Bay. Yet he has been the face of that franchise. He's been the best player on that team. And again, we've criticized the Green Bay Packers throughout the entirety of the last really 10 to 12 years for not giving Aaron Rodgers enough help on the offensive weapon side. They still have not drafted a a wide receiver uh, in the first round. The highest wide receiver they have taken since Aaron has been there was Devontae Adams in the second round. It worked out well, so the one guy they did take high, it worked out well. You you would think that means take more receivers high. They don't. They took Amari Rodgers over the uh, the weekend. I think it was a great draft pick, but again, wasn't a guy in the first round. They didn't go draft Elijah Moore with the first pick that they had in the first round. They could have taken him. They decided to go Eric Stokes, the corner instead. Again, not necessarily helping Aaron Rodgers, and the year before they drafted his replacement. Once that happened to Aaron, I think Aaron Rodgers felt disrespected by the Green Bay Packer organization that he didn't want to be their quarterback in the first place. If you remember, going into the draft, all Aaron Rodgers wanted to be was the San Francisco 49er quarterback. He wanted to be taken first overall. He wanted to be the quarterback for his hometown California franchise. But instead, he falls to the Green Bay Packers, has to sit for multiple years behind Brett Favre, a guy who wasn't the nicest in the world to him, And then he ends up being a quarterback for a franchise, to be honest, in the middle of nowhere, Wisconsin. His career did not start the way he wanted it to start. And I think Aaron wants a little bit more control over his career. He wants what Tom Brady has. Tom Brady has a team that he just got to, went completely all in on him despite of his age, and they just won a Super Bowl. I think Aaron wants that. I think Aaron wants a new chapter in his career away from the Green Bay Packers. Year in and year out, we have this debate every offseason. Who's at fault for the Packers' struggles? Is Aaron not doing enough? Is he not a good enough leader? Or is Green Bay not giving enough support? And I've said it multiple times, the only way that this story ends is with a separation or a divorce, and that's the way we are heading. Rumors are saying that if the Green Bay Packers do fire their general manager, Brian Budikins, that they might, or that Aaron might consider coming back I don't see the owner of the Green Bay Packers, a guy who is very safe, very non-risk-taking. Again, this is a franchise that always prepares for backups and drafts backups for players in case they don't want to pay them, never goes after and spends the big free agents. I don't think they're going to fire their general manager, especially since he's been a good general manager the past couple of seasons. The Green Bay Packers have been good. And I think the Green Bay Packers would rather not risk anything and stay good and stay relevant and keep making the playoffs and keeping their fans happy in that regard then maybe take a big swing, spend a ton of money, do some risky draft picks in order to help Aaron Rodgers win a Super Bowl in fear that they might not pan out and they might be taking steps back instead of steps forward. In my opinion, aggressive wins in sports. Uh, Green Bay Packers general manager Brian Budakis is not aggressive enough, and I think Aaron Rodgers is an aggressive guy in terms of wanting to win, wanting opportunities. Maybe it was different earlier in his career when he had 10-plus years left to play football. He doesn't have that right now. I think he's got one contract left. I don't see him as the type of guy who wants to play until he's 45. I believe he's 37 years old right now. I think he's about got about four or five years left max to play football. I'm not saying that Aaron Rodgers won't be able to play football at a high level five years from now. I just don't see him as the type of guy that wants to be playing 44, 45, 46. He's got other stuff he wants to do. We've obviously heard about the Jeopardy thing. He's into a bunch of tech businesses as well out in California. Uh, he's a smart guy. He does things that are more off the field stuff than just football. He has a lot of other things going on as well. And I think he wants to do that in a bigger market, in a bigger city, specifically the West Coast as well. So this was always going to happen. But if I'm Aaron Rodgers, I'm going to side with him on this just to conclude on this sort of first half of this topic. While it's an unfortunate circumstance for the Green Bay Packer fans and while Aaron Rodgers is an iconic member of that organization, this has been brewing for years now. And I think the final straw 
was drafting Jordan Love. Aaron felt disrespected by that pick, thought that they were putting a timetable and really on his career, on his passion, on his abilities. And then Aaron proved them all wrong this year by winning MVP. Green Bay comes to him and says, here's a contract extension. Thanks so much for doing what everything you do this year. And Aaron's almost saying, like, you didn't believe in me last year. Why should I stay with you now? But now you believe in me since I won that MVP? You should have gone all in on me three years ago, four years ago, five years ago. We could have multiple titles. I could be what Tom Brady was, potentially. And I get where Aaron's coming from. And again, he never wanted to be the Green Bay Packer quarterback in the first place. I don't think he has any ill will towards the city, the fans, really the organization as a whole. I just think he has an issue with their general manager and specifically that Jordan Love pick. And Aaron is saying, look... You had a plan in place. You were going to replace me anyway. I'm just accelerating that timetable for you. It's not your life to live, Aaron is saying. You don't get to control my life and my career path and how I finish myself off as a football player because you want to move off of me and go with Jordan Love. I'm not going to play your game. I'm not going to execute your plan for you. You are going to trade me is essentially what he's saying. And again, there's some teams that are being interested right now. Denver and Vegas are the two teams I've heard the most. I've also heard teams like Miami, San Francisco. We'll break down all of those teams' interest in Aaron Rodgers, and then we'll also start some of that draft recap talk. I promise I will get to the draft. It was absolutely electric. The first through seven rounds draft weekend was absolutely incredible in Cleveland. Awesome quarterback movement. Uh, We'll continue the Aaron Rodgers discussion in the next segment, and we'll start talking about some of that NFL draft stuff, specifically where the quarterbacks fell. Went into all that great stuff right after this short break. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines. They got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. back here at the GSMC Sports Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. Again, I am your host, Alex Masferat. Thank you so much for tuning into today's episode and to be continuing to listen to the show if you are a returning listener. We really do appreciate you. I just finished giving you my initial thoughts on that groundbreaking Aaron Rodgers trade slash you know unhappiness uh, report came out by Adam Schefter again on draft weekend. It was really crazy news that came out of just hours before the first round of the draft. I was so focused on the draft and where the quarterbacks were going, who's going to get picked. And then all of a sudden this Aaron Rodgers news comes out. I want to continue the conversation about it because I didn't get a chance to talk about some of the teams that have been potentially interested in Aaron Rodgers. And I want to give you the three main ones that I have been seeing as uh, reported or potentially interested. Uh, The four teams I should say that I have seen reported are Las Vegas, Denver, Miami, and San Francisco. I'm not going to include San Francisco in this because they obviously selected Trey Lance with a third overall pick. Already had some sort of discussions with the Packers about Aaron Rodgers, were rejected, and are going forward now with their current plan, which is Trey Lance and Jimmy Garoppolo. So I'm not going to include them in this sort of breakdown, but I do want to talk about Miami, but specifically Las Vegas and Denver, who I believe are the two front runners to land Aaron Rodgers if he is actually traded. Again, I do believe... This story ends with Aaron Rodgers no longer playing football for the Green Bay Packers. I don't think there's a way to salvage this. I don't see Green Bay firing their general manager. That's not how they usually operate. Again, that general manager also has a relationship with head coach Matt LaFleur. So if you're firing the general manager, how will LaFleur feel about this? Obviously, everybody in that Packer organization wants Aaron Rodgers to sign that extension, come back to Green Bay, finish his career there, and forget about that Jordan Love pick. But clearly Aaron was hurt 
and offended, really, and probably felt disrespected by that Jordan Love pick last year. And I think the burn, the bridge was burned there. It's just taken a year now for Aaron to actually make it publicly known that he wants out. I think he's probably won outed for a while, probably since the season has ended. Uh, but now that he's telling teammates that he's not coming back, he's making plans as if he's not coming back. Uh, the one way that this ends, in my opinion, is an Aaron Rodgers trade. Because Green Bay is going to want to get assets. They're going to want to recoup as much value as they can from this. And again, Green Bay had a plan. This was always the plan to eventually have Aaron Rodgers not be the quarterback there anymore. Maybe via trade. Maybe Green Bay didn't want to move off of him so quickly. Or maybe Green Bay wasn't anticipating such a great season from Aaron. Or wasn't anticipating him asking out because of this. Or feeling so hurt by that Jordan Love pick. But he is. And it's something they're going to have to deal with. And there are three teams that I think will be interested the most, Miami, Las Vegas, and Denver. Let me talk about the least likely of the three first, and that's the Miami Dolphins. Every single move the Miami Dolphins have made this offseason, including their draft over the weekend, which I will talk about because I think they absolutely nailed it, has been to build around the play style of Tua Tungavailoa. And yes, Aaron Rodgers is a commodity that comes around never, but so was also Deshaun Watson. And again, every move that Miami has made when it comes to the rehiring of uh, different offensive coordinators now that are more adapted to his play style, getting him now two speed receivers that will fit his play style that he played with at Alabama and Will Fuller and Jalen Waddell in the draft. Not to mention they boosted that offensive line as well. They also traded down from that third overall pick to pretty much end any discussion of them potentially taking a quarterback, and they obviously didn't either. And they never pulled the trigger on any trade or any extra veteran that might actually be able to beat out Tua Tungavailoa on camp. They signed with Jacoby Brissett, a guy who's a known backup, not going to do anything more than that. So I don't think they're going to pursue Aaron Rodgers the heaviest, but I think they'll check in, do their due diligence. And it's an interesting point because this Miami Dolphins defense was top three in the league last year at worst. I would even argue maybe they were the best defense in the league last year. Pittsburgh was really good. Washington was also really good last year. The Rams defense was incredible as well. So add the Miami Dolphins into that mix, and I think those are probably the top four defenses in the NFL. You put you give that to Aaron Rodgers, who and we know Brian Flores is a rock star head coach. You give him guys like Will Fuller, Devontae Parker, Mike Gesicki, you know, Jalen Waddle. Some of those guys would obviously be maybe included in a potential trade if that was going to happen. You would be talking business in Miami, and you would say that the Dolphins are potential Super Bowl contender, specifically if that roster isn't purged in a trade. Let's say a trade with the Packers for Rodgers to Miami would consistently be more draft picks. Again, they have San Francisco's first next year. In 2023, they have two first-round picks. They have multiple seconds, multiple thirds. They have a ton of draft capital, and they always do. So they're always armed for a move like this. Uh, I just don't see Brian Flores, Chris Greer, going all in on Aaron Rodgers because of how young this roster is. we got to remember this Dolphin team is still in year three of this rebuild. They exceeded expectations last year winning 10 games. Yes, they want to make the playoffs, eventually win a Super Bowl. Aaron Rodgers would help with that. But I don't know if this Miami Dolphins team and roster is necessarily built for Aaron Rodgers, who's a 37-year-old quarterback looking to win a Super Bowl right now. Miami is still rebuilding, having a ton of draft capital, ton of cap space. Again, They'll check in, and if you add Aaron Rodgers to this really talented Dolphins team with Brian Flores and a top four to five, maybe even the best defense in the National Football League, you could say that they're Super Bowl contenders. And I understand where some reporters and even some Dolphin fans are coming from with that, but I think everything that Miami has done this offseason has pointed to the fact that they really do believe in Tua Tagovailoa, who has completely changed his body this NFL offseason. You have to keep in mind as well that Tua played last year after taking essentially a year off of football because of the hip injury. During the entire draft process, instead of learning NFL schemes, learning NFL styles, building up his body, putting on weight, getting bigger, faster, and stronger, he was actually losing weight, uh, maybe in some areas getting weaker because of the rehab he was doing on his extremely traumatic hip injury. Got kind of thrown into the fire last year in Miami. Had some very high ups, like that Patriot game, like that uh, Bengal game, like that Cardinal game that he essentially won for them against Kyler Murray head-to-head on the road. Uh, but then there were also some lowlights. Did not look good in that Raider game. Did not look good in that Bronco game. Did not look good in that final game of the year against the Buffalo Bills. There was that whole controversy between him and Fitzpatrick, but I think Miami has identified he was a rookie. He was coming off a huge injury. He had some ups and downs, just like any other rookie quarterback. And also Miami really didn't run an offensive play style last year that suited to a tongue of Iloa. They changed that this offseason. I'm not saying that if Rodgers was thrown into this Miami team now, it wouldn't work. It obviously would. Aaron Rodgers can work with anybody. 
But I think everything that Miami has done is to build around Tua Tagovailoa. They believe in him, and I think it'll work out for them in the end. So, well, I do think they'll check in on Aaron Rodgers, and I understand why Rodgers would put them on a potential list, not to mention the no state income tax in Florida. The division, obviously, would also be in the AFC. So if the Packers were wanting to move him out of division, that can make sense as well. But I don't think Miami would be the team that Aaron Rodgers would go to if or when he is traded. I think Aaron has always wanted to play on the West Coast. He lives on the West Coast. Um, and I think he's always wanted to play in California. The issue with Aaron is now both California teams, uh, really all three California teams, I should say, have starting quarterbacks for now and the future. They don't need Aaron Rodgers, and they won't be trading for Aaron Rodgers. The Chargers have Justin Herbert. They're not trading Aaron Rodgers. The uh, 49ers have Jimmy Garoppolo, and they just drafted Trey Lance with the third overall pick. He's not going anywhere. They're not going after Aaron Rodgers. And the Los Angeles Rams, who apparently checked in on the Aaron Rodgers situation at the beginning of the offseason, will not be pursuing him any longer, of course, either because of the Matt Stafford trade that happened. So when you look at some other West Coast teams that could potentially be interested, Seattle has Russell Wilson, throw that out the window. Vegas and Denver make the most sense for me. Specifically these two teams as well, because both of them don't seem to be completely happy or in love with their current quarterback situations. Let me start off with Las Vegas. So if I had to rank out of those three teams, the likelihood of them being traded to them, I would put Denver as the most likely spot Vegas is number two, and Miami is number three. So I just talked about the least likely Miami at three. Let me talk about Vegas now at two. I think there's a big gap between the likelihood of Aaron being traded to Vegas than there is Miami. So there is a big gap here. I think it's close. It would be a close race between Vegas and Denver. But let me tell you why I think Vegas would make sense for Aaron Rodgers and John Gruden. John Gruden might have the most power in an organization for an NFL head coach besides guys like Andy Reid, Sean McVay, Kyle Shanahan, and Bill Belichick. He is up there with those guys with the amount of power he has in that organization. John Gruden calls the shot. He is on that 10-year, $100 million contract. We know how much Mark Davis, the owner, loves John Gruden. And they're aggressive. They're starting that new stadium in Vegas. They just moved there a little over a year ago. They have a new fan base uh, as well to go along with the fans that are still in Oakland, obviously. But obviously in a new town, new city, they want to be flashy. And they can't seem to get over the hump with this current team. The offense is there. They score a boatload of points. They have a ton of weapons. And Derek Carr was really, really efficient last year. And they had a great offensive line last year that they've kind of retooled and reworked uh, in the draft this year in some questionable ways, by the way. Why might I ask with that Alex Leatherwood pick? I don't really necessarily agree with that pick at all. I picked 17. But we know that John Gruden's aggressive. We know that the owner is aggressive. They play in a division with Patrick Mahomes and Justin Herbert. So it's looking like Derek Carr is never going to be better than either of those two guys going forward for the rest of his career. So you know that they have to make an upgrade at quarterback if they want to compete with Mahomes and Herbert for the next decade. Aaron Rodgers would make a ton of sense. Again, the West Coast connection, Aaron wants to play there. It would also be an AFC team, so the Roger, or so the Packers wouldn't have to see him uh, twice a year if they traded him in division or anything like that either. So uh, it makes sense if Aaron were to be traded. I think it would be to an AFC team, so the Green Bay Packers would have to see him as few times as possible. Uh, here's the only issue with the Raiders. I don't know what a trade package would necessarily look like. They could throw in a bunch of picks. They don't have a lot of players I could see maybe being added besides Henry Ruggs. Would Josh Jacobs be included in the trade? I don't think so. I think it'd be more centered around Henry Ruggs, maybe somebody on the offensive line. Maybe you throw in Derek Carr to be a backup slash mentor to Jordan Love if he's still not ready. Again, it's hard to come with a trade uh, for between the Raiders and the uh, Packers. I don't think they necessarily have as much assets as a team like the Denver Broncos do if you wanted to pursue a guy like Aaron Rodgers. So, well, I think John Gruden's uber aggressive, super smart, super complex offense and system. Uh, He's been gushing about Aaron Rodgers on TV for years now. He would absolutely sign up to do that. And again, every single year we hear about the Raiders potentially being a quarterback destination. They're not satisfied with Derek Carr's play. Obviously, Marcus Mariota potentially replacing Derek Carr was a question and really a topic of discussion at the beginning of last season. So while I do think the Raiders would be uber aggressive in trading for Aaron Rodgers, I don't think they will be able to present the best offer for him. And I don't believe they're as desperate for a quarterback as a team like the Denver Broncos are. So let's talk about the Broncos, who I believe, if and when Aaron Rodgers will be traded, I believe this is the team that Aaron Rodgers is going to be traded to. In my opinion, I believe that when Aaron Rodgers uh, is eventually traded, I think he will be a Denver Bronco. They have done this before. Uh, John Elway is not the general manager of the Broncos anymore. Now that's George Payton or Patton. Um, he, I think he has a lot of control 
and he is definitely the one calling the shots, making the draft picks. I think he was a huge factor in the Teddy Bridgewater trade. But I think John Elway's voice still looms pretty loud in that front office, as it probably should. They like that veteran quarterback. They already added Teddy Bridgewater. They've done this before with Peyton Manning. John Elway, I, I wouldn't have surprised me if he has a relationship with Aaron Rodgers, just as he's an NFL legend. Uh, Aaron's an NFL legend, obviously, as well. This makes a little bit too much sense. Similar situation to the Raiders as they're in the same division with the Chiefs and the Chargers. They need to be more dynamic at quarterback. They have a really good defense. Vic Vangio is, a, I think, a really good defensive-minded head coach. They have a lot of offensive weapons. They just drafted Javonta Williams at a UNC, one of my favorite, most underrated running backs in this class, in my opinion, to go along with Melvin Gordon. Noah Fant is on that team. K.J. Hamler, Cortland Sutton is also on that team. Obviously on the defensive end, Von Miller, Simmons. They just drafted Patrick Sertain, who arguably is the best corner in this draft class uh, with the ninth overall pick. Really good team, plays in a tough division, and they don't have a good quarterback. That's why they brought Teddy Bridgewater in to either push Drew Locke or be the starter for that team. Here's another thing that they have. Young pieces that can be traded. Just like I mentioned uh, that the Raiders don't have a lot of young people that could potentially be traded. Because again, if you're trading Aaron Rodgers, in my opinion, Green Bay would go into a full youth movement. Not necessarily rebuilding though. I think they're a really talented roster and LaFleur's a really good coach. So I don't think they'd be rebuilding. It'd be more retooling. Still competing for that division with the Bears and Vikings, but at the same time being a really young competitive team that's only going to get better. Still having Devontae Adams, still having Aaron Jones, you'd have Jordan Love as the quarterback, and I think a trade package that you could send Aaron Rodgers to to Denver could include somebody like a Jerry Judy receiver rookie last year out of Alabama who had some drop issues, but incredible route running, great speed, great size. You could maybe get him in a trade for Aaron Rodgers. Bradley Chubb, a name to keep an eye on, potentially in a trade with Denver. I'm not saying you can necessarily get both, but if I'm Green Bay, I want those two guys and at least two first-round picks for Aaron Rodgers. And here's what the question comes down to for Green Bay. Where are you going to win a Super Bowl in the next two years? That's what Aaron Rodgers' current contract is, right? Let's say he's, you know what, I'm not signing the extension. But if you don't trade him and you force him to play, and by some miracle he agrees to just play out his contract before he signs somewhere else and gets the hell out of there, were you going to win a Super Bowl in the next two years with an angry Aaron Rodgers? Chances are you weren't going to win them with a happy Aaron Rodgers the way that the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are looking, the way that the Chiefs are looking, the way that the Ravens are looking, the way that the Colts are maybe looking, the way that the young Miami Dolphins are potentially looking. And you want to go in the NFC. The Saints are going to come back. They're going to find their quarterback eventually. That's already a loaded roster. I just mentioned Tampa Bay. The Rams are on the rise. San Francisco is going to be right back. Seattle can always turn it around. Arizona knocked it out of the park with this draft. They're coming on the come up. And you took a step back, Green Bay. You lost Corey Lindsay, did not replace him with a quality center. You didn't get a number one true, or I should say number two dominant wide receiver to pair with Devontae Adams. Uh, you got an Amari Rodgers, who's a nice slot sort of uh, gadget piece, I would say, but not a true number two receiver in this league. And you didn't address the linebacking problems either, or really the pass rush issue. So if you're Green Bay, move off of Aaron Rodgers, go with the youth movement, Ask for Chubb, Judy, and two firsts and trade him to Denver. And if you're Denver, you get Aaron Rodgers. You've done this dance before. Veteran quarterback. Go all in. Try to win a Super Bowl. Beat out Mahomes and Herbert. But man, how much fun would it be to see Justin Herbert, Patrick Mahomes, and Aaron Rodgers play each other like twice a year, all of them? That would be an incredible six games. And that's just in-division play. I really, really want to see it. And I do believe that the Denver Broncos would be far and away the favorites to land Aaron Rodgers. They have the combination of those young pieces, some of those draft picks, the West Coast AFC thing that I think Green Bay and Aaron both want. I think Aaron wants to play on the West Coast. I think Green Bay wants them out of the NFC. I think sooner or later, Green Bay will is a smart... I mean, Green Bay is a smart organization. They're well run. This isn't the Jets. This isn't the Browns. This isn't the Jaguars of old or something like that. This is a well-run, competent organization that knows when things are up. They always prepare for this stuff like this. You could argue that this is why they drafted Jordan Love, in case you know Aaron ever wanted out, and now he does. They'll move with him eventually. I don't think Aaron will retire. I don't think Green Bay is going to try to force to make the situation work. I think eventually they will move him before a training camp or the season starts. Denver, Vegas, Miami to keep an eye on. I think Denver's the overwhelming favorite to land Aaron Rodgers, and I think it would be a hell of a lot of fun. All right, that's going to do it for this segment. On the other side of this short break, we can finally talk about that draft that we saw Thursday through Saturday. Electric first round. I will be breaking down all of the quarterbacks, or I should say the main quarterbacks that were drafted in the first round, including David Millis 
and Kellen Mond. I want to break down those two picks by the Texans and Vikings respectively and what it means for those two guys as well. I don't want to just give talk about the main quarterbacks. We'll get into all that great quarterback talking and draft talk right after this short break. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G. SMCpodcast.com for more info. back here at the GSMC Sports Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. Again, I am your host, Alex Masford. Thank you so much for tuning into today's episode and to be continuing to listen to the show. If you are a returning listener, we really do appreciate you. I just finished giving you a breakdown on those three teams that I believe will be pursuing Aaron Rodgers if and when he is traded. Again, I think Denver is far and away the favorites. They have the best combination of proven track record, with veteran quarterbacks before, uh, a high-capable roster, West Coast, uh, West Coast team, which is where I believe Aaron wants to play, AFC team, which is probably where the Green Bay Packers want to trade him, and they have a bunch of nice young pieces on both offense and defense, and enough draft picks to potentially get an Aaron Rodgers deal done. And if he is traded, I do believe Denver would be that team. Now, halfway through the episode, we can finally break down some of those awesome draft picks that I saw. The draft was absolutely electric this weekend. So many surprises, a bunch of trade-ups, trades down. Uh, The top 10 was really, really intriguing. Uh, I just want to give you a couple of quick thoughts. Uh, In my next segment, I'll be giving you my favorite five draft classes from the weekend, and I'll be giving you some of my just favorite picks overall and some picks and stuff, so we'll get into that. But for this segment, I want to focus on the main quarterbacks that were drafted in this year's class. I want to talk about Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson, Trey Lance, Justin Fields, and Mac Jones. You know about all those, but I also want to talk about Kellen Mond and David Mills, who went in the third round respectively, both two really interesting teams. So I also want to talk about both of those guys. So I want to break down all of these draft picks, the fit with the team, how does it make sense, and what do I think will be happening career-wise for all these guys. First of all, Trevor Lawrence. It's official. We knew this was going to happen. We knew he was going to be the Jacksonville Jaguar quarterback. I am under the belief that this is going to work. I think Trevor Lawrence may not be as generate. I think he is a generational talent. I do believe that. I've heard comparisons to Elway. I've mentioned John Elway as a comparison. I think the play style is similar. I don't think he is as big as John Elway. I think he is a generational talent, but I don't know if he is... I don't know. Andrew Luck coming out of college to me screamed, this guy can't miss, generational prospect and everything like that. Trevor Lawrence is a lot like that. I just don't know if he's at that exact level. I think he's a little skinny. I think he can work on some mechanics stuff. And he doesn't break a lot of tackles. But again, you're nitpicking at this point. He's extremely accurate. Has a cannon of an arm. 6'6". Can run like a gazelle. uh, And can pretty much do it all for your team. Won a national championship. One of the best college quarterbacks in Clemson history. College football history. It's going to work. Urban Meyer knows the college game. Knows offensive college schemes and systems. And pretty much now, the NFL offense is a lot about the college offense. There's a lot of similarities, a lot of overlap, a lot of spread, a lot of four wide, a lot of motion plays nowadays. Urban Meyer knows that. It's the future of the NFL. Urban Meyer is a smart guy. He is a smart football person. He would not have come out of retirement to go coach the Jacksonville Jaguars of all teams if he didn't know that Trevor Lawrence was going to be that level of a quarterback. It's on Jacksonville. It's on the coaches. It's on the organization to make sure what happened to Andrew Luck doesn't happen to Trevor Lawrence. Make sure he's protected. Make sure he has weapons, a defense. That division is wide open, man. 
it's looking like Deshaun Watson is never going to play a game for the Houston Texans again. I think it's going to work out with Carson Wentz and the Colts, but hey, it could not. And uh, I don't know how much we trust the Tennessee Titans year in, year out. Uh, again, I like Ryan Tannehill. I like everything they're doing. They lost a lot of pieces in this most recent offseason. So, again, it's going to be interesting to see how everything plays out in that division. And I think there could be a big-time opportunity for the Jacksonville Jaguars in the recent future. I don't think it'll be this year. I think they're still in that rebuild. They also drafted Travis Etienne, a surprising pick. Um, they addressed some other needs like corner in the draft as well. But we knew this was going to happen. I think it's going to work out statistically for Trevor Lawrence. I think he is too talented to fail. But will Jacksonville get enough pieces around him for him to compete year in, year out? That is the bigger question. But I think all in all, fantastic pick by the Jaguars. It was the only guy you could have taken. And I think the Jacksonville Jaguars have their quarterback set up for the long term. Next up is Jack's, or is Jets. And uh, they selected Zach Wilson as everybody expected. I have some concerns about Zach Wilson. I have some concerns about his size. I have his concern about his processing when pressure is in his face. And I have some concerns about him being the guy who's supposed to save one of the most dysfunctional organizations in the NFL, the New York Jets. Luckily for him, the New York Jets absolutely killed this draft, going along with Elijah Veritucka, Elijah Moore, Michael Carter, after adding Corey Davis in free agency. Uh, so the Jets have put pieces around Zach Wilson already in year one than they did for Sam Darnold. There's more pieces for Zach Wilson to work with this year than Sam Darnold had his entirety of his Jets career. So I do believe that the Jets will be proven right in a way on the Sam Darnold trade. I think that Zach Wilson will be more successful with the Jets than Sam Darnold was successful with the Jets. However, I do think Sam will do really, really good things um, in Carolina. But back to the Jets. They surrounded him with a lot of great pieces I question his size, and again, he was 0-5 against teams with either NFL coaching experience or one of the top programs in the country. Again, he didn't face Alabama or anything like that, but he lost to Coastal Carolina, a couple other teams that had some NFL coaching experience, ran NFL schemes on him, and he struggled heavily. He's going into a division now with Sean McDermott, a defensive head coach, the Buffalo Bills are rolling, Brian Flores, a rock star defensive head coach, the Miami Dolphins are on the come up, and Bill Belichick, who's obviously the best defensive coach, or just coach, period, And that defense got a lot better, and now New England with Mac Jones might be on the comeback as well. So I think Zach Wilson, if he went to an easier division, I would like to say works out. But if you have to label one guy in this class who went as a first round, who is definitely going to bust, I don't know if you can label any of them as definite busts, but Zach Wilson to me seems like the guy who might have the worst career out of all the people picked in the first round just because of the situation he landed in. I'm not trying to take away from Joe Douglas or Robert Sala. In fact, I think Robert Sala will be a good head coach in this league, and I think Joe Douglas is a good GM in this league. But because of Zach Wilson's struggles against NFL coach defense and with pressure in your face, he has easily exploitable weaknesses. And I think Brian Flores, Bill Belichick, and Sean McDermott is just too good of a division to go to when you have weaknesses like that if you're going to pan out fully. I'm not saying that he'll be a bust or a bad player. I just don't know how many games he's actually going to win. With the third pick, the San Francisco 49ers took Trey Lance and fooled everybody into thinking, including myself, that they were going to take Mac Jones. This was a home run pick. I told you I would take Trey Lance. When this move first happened, I said it was for Trey Lance. Uh, I wish I stuck to my gut on that. I obviously changed my mind and thought it was going to be Mac Jones eventually, but my gut reaction was Trey Lance. He can do it all. He is truly, besides probably Kyle Pitts, the unicorn of this draft class. He can run. He can throw deep. Um, He's got some accuracy issues and some mechanic issues. I don't actually expect him to play for San Francisco this year, but this was the match made in heaven. Kyle Shanahan, the quarterback guru, one of the smartest offensive minds in football, gets paired with one of the most raw, talented quarterback prospects we've seen over the last 10 years. It's going to work. The only question is when. When will we see Trey Lance? I think we'll see him probably at some point this year. But I do not believe they're going to be trading Jimmy Garoppolo at all. I think he is the day one starter. The earliest I believe we see Trey Lance would be, I mean, assuming Jimmy Garoppolo stays healthy. If Jimmy Garoppolo gets hurt, I could see Trey Lance being forced into action sooner rather than later because of Jimmy's injury history. But assuming he stays healthy next year, earliest we see him is the last four games of the year, assuming San Francisco doesn't have the year they want. Assuming they do have the year they want and they make the playoffs, we might not see Trey Lance for a single snap next season, except for maybe the last game of the year if they've already clinched a playoff spot. And in my opinion, that's a good thing. Trey Lance is coming at 20 years old to be an NFL quarterback, coming from the FCS after taking essentially a year off of football, 
not necessarily that he wasn't working out or anything. Of course he has been, and he's in great shape and doing all that stuff, but just hasn't really been able to play live football in a year because his season was moved to the spring, obviously leading him to opt out, prepare for the NFL draft, which is also in the spring. So I don't think we'll be seeing Trey Lance this year. The Kyle Shanahan system is complicated to begin with. Apparently his football IQ is off the charts. I have no doubt that he will learn the system sooner rather than later. I just don't expect him to play soon because of how raw he is, because of what they already have in Jimmy Garoppolo. There is no rush to put Trey Lance out there like it is for Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson, help maybe even Mac Jones and Justin Fields because of the Jimmy Garoppolo security blanket that the San Francisco 49ers have. I expect them to take their time with Trey Lance, and I really do believe this is going to work. I think Trey Lance is going to be a scary football player for opposing defenses for years to come. This reminds me of Josh Allen all over again, man. I would even argue he's more talented than Josh Allen in the athletic department. Uh, He's not as big or as strong as Josh Allen. He's certainly faster, and I think he's a better runner. Uh, I think Josh Allen is definitely a dual-threat quarterback. I don't know the extent of that dual-threatness. Trey Lance has close to Lamar Jackson explosiveness when you look at his speed and his size. Reminds me of a faster, smaller Cam Newton, to be honest with you. And uh, it wouldn't surprise me if we got 2015 MVP Cam in the form of Trey Lance for San Francisco. I really do believe that. I think it was an awesome pick. All right, moving on to the Chicago Bears. They ended up getting Justin Fields. I said they would get Justin Fields in my mock draft, but they ended up trading up to the 11th pick to secure him, something I did not see coming. I think it was absolutely worth it. He plays a similar style to Mitch Trubisky, except he is just an uber-talented version of that. Matt Nagy, I believe, went 27-13, and which Mitch Trubisky is a starter. He's going to do just fine with Justin Fields. Uh, Justin Fields, in my opinion, is this year's Justin Herbert. Uh, I don't think he'll be as good as Justin Herbert was his rookie year, but I think he was overly scrutinized, overly nitpicked, and uh, I think he just suffered from prospect fatigue. We had heard about Justin Fields for so long, he didn't necessarily take a massive step forward since last year. Not that he had to. He threw 43 touchdowns and three interceptions that year. Had a a great year this year as well. Uh, That game against Clemson, six touchdowns, over 400 yards passing. Did it all. Can run, can move. Reminds me of Dak Prescott, but faster. And I think the the Chicago Bears finally have a quarterback that you can look at and go, wow, we got a game plan for this guy. This guy is a problem. He is a mismatch, right, for our linebackers. And uh, he's got an absolute cannon, can work on some mechanic stuff, can work on some short-term accuracy stuff, but nobody's a perfect prospect. They have Andy Dalton, who I believe will start the season, but I believe we will see Justin Fields this year, and I think we'll see Justin Fields early. The fans are going to want to see him. Matt Nagy wants a mobile quarterback in this system, and if you think that Matt Nagy won a lot of games with Mitch Trubisky, imagine if Mitch Trubisky was actually as talented as people were hyping him up to be in the draft. That's what Justin Fields is. And it wouldn't surprise me that when the Packers trade Aaron Rodgers, if the Chicago Bears won this division next year with Justin Fields. I'm that high on him. Wouldn't surprise me if he had an outstanding rookie campaign in this system with all of these weapons, including Allen Robinson and David Montgomery, a pretty stacked defense as well. And if Aaron Rodgers is out of that division, the NFC uh, North is absolutely wide the hell open. And Detroit's not doing anything. And Vikings, and the Vikings have a lot of question marks too. Chicago with that defense, finally with a real talented quarterback and Justin Fields, some magical things could be happening in Chi-Town with the Bears. I loved the pick. I loved the trade-up to get ahead of New England. Good for Ryan Pace for finally getting a quarterback that we can all look at and respect and go, yep, this guy is talented. Everybody thought when they drafted Mitch Trubisky it was an overdraft. Nobody thinks that with Justin Fields' home run pick, in my opinion. You should be very, very, very excited if you are a Chicago Bear fan. Now let's get to Mac Jones. Thought he was going to go third overall. He ended up being the quarterback prospect that dropped. Um, makes sense. He's the fifth most talented quarterback in this division or in this uh, draft class, in my, opinion, in my uh, opinion. He should have gone fifth. I think this is what everybody had him as after the national championship game, and that's nothing wrong with Mac Jones. He came into this uh, season not even on the NFL's radar when it came to a day one or two prospect. He was not even necessarily supposed to start for Alabama this year. Some people were saying the true freshman Bryce Young was supposed to come in. For him to get drafted by New England was probably the second best thing that could have happened to him. Obviously, him going to San Francisco probably would have led to him winning right away. Good things for his career, but I don't know how it would have worked long term. New England should have been his second favorite spot to go to. I know he said deep down he wanted to go to New England. Not sure if I believe him on that. I think he wanted to get picked by San Francisco. But I would definitely rather get picked by the New England Patriots than the Jets or the Jaguars or even the Chicago Bears at this point. So he's going to New England. Stacked defense. Incredible offensive line. They addressed the weaponry issue in free agency, Hunter Henry, John U. Smith, Nelson Aguilar to pair along with Jacoby Myers, Gunnar Olszewski, who's a guy coming up on that roster, and a couple of other nice pieces. Damian Harris in the background, Sony Michelle, 
Bill Belichick, Josh McDaniels. Again, what's my issue with Mac Jones? It's, it's a talent issue. I think he's cerebral. I think he's got great footwork. Comes from a tennis background. Great pocket movement. Accurate. Great ball placement. Just not talented enough when it comes to the arm strength and the athletic ability to win a Super Bowl, in my opinion. But on his best day, he looks like Kirk Cousins. And if you gave the New England Patriots Kirk Cousins today, I think they'd be completing for a playoff spot day in, day out. I think we're seeing Mac Jones early. Uh, and it wouldn't surprise me if he started week one. I know Bill said Cam's our quarterback and all that stuff. Don't be surprised if Mac Jones beats him out day one. Everything Cam Newton can do with his arm, I think Mac Jones can do too. It's just that athletic ability that Cam has that Mac cannot present. But Mac Jones is definitely a more accurate thrower of the football right now than Cam Newton at this stage of his career. And it wouldn't surprise me if Bill Belichick and Josh McDaniels value accuracy and cerebralness over Cam's uh, dual threat ability. Don't be surprised if Mac Jones starts as soon as week one for the New England Patriots. I think it was a good pick for the value. New England did not have to move up, which was surprising to me. So because of that fact, I think that it was a good pick by the New England Patriots. Do I think Mac Jones is going to work to the fullest extent like a Super Bowl or a division title? Not necessarily because of how good the Bills and Dolphins are looking, but this guy is a competent NFL quarterback, and in this Patriots system, I believe he will develop into Kirk Cousins 2.0 essentially. All right, I want to talk about the other two quarterbacks that were taken in the third round. Kellen Mond to the Vikings, speaking of Kirk Cousins, and David Mills to the uh, tennis, or the uh, Houston Texans. Let's talk about Kellen Mond. This is why this was so interesting. We've heard rumors that Kirk Cousins might not be there long term with the Minnesota Vikings despite getting that extension. Kirk Cousins is a limited quarterback. Cerebral, good footwork, accurate, just like Mac Jones. Kellen Mond has a big arm and mobile. Two completely different styles of quarterback play, I don't think there's going to be a quarterback competition. Kellen Mond was labeled, besides Trey Lance, as the project quarterback of this draft class. I think he sits the entirety of this year. But don't be surprised if next offseason we're talking about a Kirk Cousins trade, cut, or release. Because they are very high on Kellen Mond. uh, And he could start for the Vikings as soon as next year. Him, just like Trey Lance, I do not believe we will be seeing this season. And uh, I think we're going to be looking towards 2022 to see both Trey Lance and potentially Kellen Mond as the starter for the Minnesota Vikings. Really fascinating pick. Another really interesting pick. David Mills, the Stanford quarterback who was shooting up of draft boards, went to the Houston Texans in the third round. That was the first pick that the Houston Texans had made. The first pick Nick Casario made as the Houston Texans general manager. The writing is on the wall. Deshaun Watson will not be taking another snap as a Houston Texans quarterback anymore. He's either going to trade it or the off the field issues are going to handle itself and he won't be playing football again for other reasons. But if he is allowed to return to the NFL and those things get cleared, he will be traded. They have Tyrod Taylor and David Mills now. Don't be surprised if David Mills is this year's Gardner Minshew and he starts from week one. He could totally beat out Tyrod Taylor. He's a talented kid, limited starts, but I'm really intrigued by this pick. And Houston must be very high on him considering Nick Casario's very first pick as the Houston Texans general manager was to take that quarterback. The writing is on the wall. The Sean Watson will no longer be the quarterback of the Houston Texans for off the field issues or for other reasons. But David Mills could be starting week one. Don't be surprised. That was another fascinating pick. All right, that's going to do it for this segment. On the other side of this final short break, we're going to be breaking down my favorite five draft classes from the weekend. And uh, yeah, and I think that'll be a lot of fun. I loved these specific five draft classes. I think they were all A-plus draft grades, and I think they got a lot of starters out of them. So let's talk about those five draft classes that I love so much right after this short break. Are you looking for help for your fantasy football team? Check out the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Get today's best advice on who to start, who to sit, even who you should draft. From sleeper picks to red-hot lineups, they got it all covered for you. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy-football-podcast. We'll cover traditional leagues, dynasty, PPR, even IDP leagues. When you need fantasy help, there's just one show to hit up. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. All
right, and we are back here at the GSMC Sports Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network for today's final segment of today's absolutely packed NFL Draft slash Aaron Rodgers news filled show. And for the final segment of today's show, I want to give you my top five draft classes, early reactions. These are the five best teams that drafted well uh, over the weekend, in my opinion, improved their team the most based off where they started versus where they are now. And I think a lot of these teams made some real differences enough to win multiple more games now because of these draft classes. So let's get right into it. The fifth best draft class that I think came out today, and also, by the way, all of these draft classes for me would receive an A-plus grade. I know a lot of people like to do gradings of draft classes, and maybe I'll do that in my next episode uh, for all 32 teams. Maybe I'll do that. But for t- in particular, these five, I would all give an A-plus to. I think they absolutely knocked it out of the park. And I don't think there's a lot of separation between all of these teams in, retard- in, in uh, uh, terms of their draft class. But I had to do some sort of ranking system, so let's get into it. The fifth best draft class from this year, in my opinion, belongs to the Carolina Panthers. I think they absolutely killed it. You want to talk about the eighth overall pick, J.C. Horn? He was my favorite corner. I think he could be a stronger, more physical version of Richard Sherman. In the second round, they got Terrence Marshall Jr., one of the most underrated wide receiver prospects in this class. And round three, they get Brady Christensen, the best player on that BYU offensive line that did not allow Zach Wilson to get touched at all. He's a tackle. They got him in the third round. And then in the fourth round, they get Chubba Hubbard, who would be an excellent sort of backup slash power back for Christian McCaffrey to keep him rested, not give him, you know, 30 touches a game. Again, he's had some injury problems specifically last year. And then I really liked their uh, sixth-round pick, Shai Smith, wide receiver um, out of South Carolina. And, of course, they also got Deontay Brown, the guard, out of Alabama. Fantastic draft, draft class for Matt Rule, the entire management over in Carolina. They traded down a bunch of times, too, I believe, uh, and uh, picked up some extra draft picks. But, yeah, my favorite picks from them. J.C. Horn, Terrence Marshall, Brady Christensen. Uh, I, I like the Tommy Tremble pick. I, I didn't love it, but I really like the Chubba Hubbard pick too. And uh, Leontay Brown is also, or Deontay Brown, pretty good guard. I think he'd be a nice piece, potentially as a rotational guard. And uh, I think Shai Smith could play, man. But Terrence Marshall, really, really like that pick. Good guy to potentially replace Curtis Samuel, who went to the football team in the offseason. And uh, I really like that J.C. Horn pick too. The Panthers saw what I saw uh, in J.C. Horn and said that he is better than Patrick Sertain, who went 9 to the Broncos. So, yeah, I absolutely loved the Panthers draft uh, this year. I would give them an A+, and they were my fifth favorite draft class uh, from this weekend. So, again, coming in number 5, Carolina Panthers. Coming in number 4, I have the Cleveland Browns. I think they really knocked especially the first two picks out of the park. They took Greg Newsom, the cornerback in the first round, guy who could start right away on the boundary for them to go along with Greedy Williams and Denzel Ward. They also added John Johnson uh, in free agency, really boosting that secondary. I thought they got Greg Newsom later in the first round. I thought he would have gone earlier. Uh, fantastic pickup there. And then a guy who I thought they could have picked in the first round, but they passed on Jeremiah uh, Owusu Komura. I think I'm saying that right. I'm just going to call him JOK for the rest of the segment. Uh, I thought they could have picked him in the first round. He fell because of some schematic issues. Teams are kind of unclear on where to play him on the field. He's a safety linebacker hybrid. They get him in the second round. He could end up becoming the steal of the draft. Anthony Schwartz, the speedy wide receiver, uh, coming in in the third round, I think was fantastic too. And with their last pick, they took a guy who I liked a lot, Demetric Felton, the running back slash wide receiver coming out of UCLA. I think he was fantastic too. But specifically those first two picks for Cleveland, they needed defensive help, getting JOK and Greg Newsom with your first two picks, two guys who should have gone way earlier than they did. I think they got two absolute steals, bolstering their defense and their secondary, which was their biggest issue. In theory, JOK could be a safety meaning that in this offseason they have added two safeties and a cornerback, addressing their biggest need by far, uh, which was secondary help. Fantastic for the Cleveland Browns. I think they did an incredible job. Um, For them to move up to pick number 52 to get JOK, that was really surprising to me. Again, he's a hybrid-style defender. Uh, He's incredible. He hits hard like a linebacker, but also moves and covers like a safety. Thought he would have gone in the first round. Uh, Ended up falling to the 52nd pick in the draft. So not even like the beginning, 20 picks into that second round. Cleveland traded up, said enough's enough. We need to get this guy on our roster. And they acquired him. Fantastic draft for the Browns. Um, I think them and the Panthers had pretty similar drafts when it comes to just improving their roster and their needs. Panthers had more players I liked. But I think the Browns are the two best players besides J.C. Horn um, in comparison to those two draft classes. But uh, Browns absolutely knocked it out of the park. Uh, I would give it an A+. Because of those first two picks. 
And I would say that, that de- they are definitely a top five draft class. And I have them coming in at number four. Number three, I have the Arizona Cardinals. I thought same thing. With their first two picks, they absolutely knocked it out of the park. Again, getting Xavier Collins in the first round. An incredible hybrid, not necessarily hybrid, but really, really fast coverage. Also, hard-hitting linebacker. Uh, guy who necessarily wasn't a reach. Also, just picked at the right spot, I would say. Absolutely fantastic. Hits hard. Is fast. If you want to see an awesome sound bite, go uh, look up on uh, Cardinals social media. Uh, the phone call between uh, the general manager of the Cardinals and Xavier Collins talking about how he's going to hit people and it's going to be great and they're going to win Super Bowls. Xavier Collins, and then to get Rondell Moore, in my opinion, who is a first-round talent wide receiver. He's a little small, but he is fast, shifty, and physical. Again, he was up there for me. Uh, if you remember the segment that I got, I did a bunch of episodes ago about my wide receivers, my favorite receivers in this draft. He was one of them. I absolutely love Rondell Moore. Him in the spread system with Kyler Murray and Cliff Kingsbury is almost unfair. He's going to thrive in that role. Pairing him with DeAndre Hopkins, so Rondell Moore has to be covered by your third, maybe even fourth best cornerback. That's a crime, and that's going to be absolutely awesome for the Arizona Cardinals. They took an absolutely massive leap this year. I really do believe with the addition of J.J. Watt, what they did on defense, adding some other guys like James Conner, bringing in Xavier Collins, an absolute beast of a linebacker. I think Isaiah Simmons will take a big leap this year, meaning that is an incredibly athletic linebacking core now with Collins and Simmons. Adding Rondell Moore to that already explosive offense. Rondell Moore is going to be like what Andy Isabella was supposed to be, but 10 times that. You can give him the ball on bubble screens. He'll break tackles, bring the hit to you despite being 5'7", 5'8". Absolutely thought they knocked both of those picks out of the park and uh, added a lot of nice depth positions to a corner they needed. Uh, they added a center, a linebacker, and also drafted two corners and a safety as well. Everything, they addressed a bunch of needs, and uh, I think they really knocked it out of the park. They get an A-plus for me, and I think they have the third best draft class. Coming in at number two, and the number two and number one, this was really hard for me. I, I, I thought both of these teams were far, not necessarily far and away, but I really loved the Cardinals, Browns, and Panthers draft class. But what the Jets did and what the Dolphins did were the two best draft classes, in my opinion, and they both absolutely knocked it out of the park. I put the Jets at two and the Dolphins at one. Uh, let me break that down. For the New York Jets, they added Zach Wilson, which was the pick that we all knew they were going to do. But for them to be able to add guys like Elijah Moore in the second round, and specifically trading up for Elijah Vera Tucker, who was the best interior offensive lineman in this class, was absolutely home run stuff. Adding Michael Carter in the fourth round after adding Elijah Moore in the second, they got, in my opinion, three first-round caliber players in Zach Wilson, Elijah Vera Tucker, and Elijah Moore, and they didn't even take one of them in the first round. Not to mention, I think Michael Carter was a third-round talent, not a fourth-round talent, and they got him in the very top of the fourth round. I think they've already surrounded Zach Wilson with a better line, defense, and wide receiver and weapons than they ever gave Sam Darnold in his four years in New York. And uh, anything you can do to make Zach Wilson better will help the New York Jets get him more weapons, make him feel more comfortable as a rookie as he's going to have to start right away. But for them to not only get their quarterback of the future, but get probably the best interior offensive line prospect in this draft, everyone says that Elijah Vera Tucker is a can't-miss interior guard, fast, can pull, do all that stuff. And then add Elijah Moore, in my opinion, who should have been selected in the 20s, let alone the 40, or let alone the uh, late 30s. Home run draft for the New York Jets. They might have added two wins because of this draft class. I really do believe that. Elijah Moore, Corey Davis, Denzel Mims. That's a legitimate wide receiver room to pair along with Michael Carter, who's a legitimate RPO style running back. Will thrive in a Shanahan type system that the New York Jets are going to run. Fantastic stuff. But I do believe that the Miami Dolphins won this draft pick, this draft, and I'll tell you why. Just like I told you, just like I told you about the Jets, I think the Jets found three concrete, excellent starters who all had round one grades. Zach Wilson, Elijah Moore, and Elijah Vera Tucker for me were all round one capable prospects who were home run draft picks. I think that the Miami Dolphins got four players who have first round talent and will start for them right away. Let's talk about Jalen Waddle. Fits perfectly with Will Fuller, who is a vertical spacer. Jalen Waddle is a horizontal spacer. Both of them fit with Tua Tagovailoa. The Dolphins were last in yards after the catch and separation percentage for receivers. 
things that are not going to help your young rookie quarterback in Tua Tungavailoa, who's used to throwing with guys with separation. And again, Tua's game is built off of timing, accuracy, and ball placement. He does not like to throw the jump ball. That's not his game. He's more built like Brady in that regard, where he would rather place the ball in the right spot, get the guy to uh, get the ball to the guy uh, in open space, and manipulate the defense with his eyes, feet, and hips to get those guys open. But there's only so much he can do. But now adding Will Fuller and specifically Jalen Waddle, who might be one of the fastest wide receivers to ever come into the game of football. Absolutely electric stuff. I think they nailed that first pick. Then, with the 18th pick, they selected Jalen Phillips. So, in my mock draft, I had the Dolphins selecting both Jalen Waddle and Jalen Phillips, and I think that was a dream scenario for Dolphin fans. Jalen Phillips was actually a higher-rated defensive end prospect coming out of high school than Chase Young, was forced to medically retire at UCLA, got his body right and everything at, at Miami, absolutely exploded, uh, having, I think, I think six or seven sacks in the last four games for Miami. He has the potential to be the best defensive player in this class. In my opinion, he was far and away the best pass rusher in this class, and he is the guy who could turn into a Bosa brother. He could be that good for the Miami Dolphins. Him going to Brian Flores in that scheme and that system is must be a dream for Jalen Phillips. Keeping him in the city that helped him get his football career back on track medically as well has to be an awesome feeling for him. So for them to come out of the first round with Jalen Waddle, who might be one of the most electric wide receivers the Miami Dolphins have had, period. And for Jalen Phillips to be available at 18, a guy who, in my opinion, could end up being a double-digit sack guy as soon as year three for the Miami Dolphins, home run stuff. But it doesn't stop there. They get the best safety in the class and Javon Holland, who's a hard-hitting ball hawk safety that knows how to stretch the field and go from end to end and hit guys. And then in the second round, they also had Liam Eckenberg, who is maybe the most NFL-ready tackle in this class, not named Rashawn Slater and Panay Sewell, who was a four-year starter at Notre Dame, had his not missed a game for Notre Dame, despite having one game where his eye was essentially forced to be shut because of a black eye. And he hasn't given up a sack since 2018. So in my opinion, the Miami Dolphins found four dudes who are going to be able to start for them right away on an already good 10-win football team. Jalen Waddle is going to make an immediate impact, and it wouldn't surprise me if he won Offensive Rookie of the Year. Jalen Phillips has maybe the biggest boom or bust prospect or boom quality to him out of any defensive player in this draft. He could easily be a 13 sack a year type of guy if his potential is reached by year three. Javion Holland in this Brian Flores secondary system is going to be an absolute animal. And I think Liam Eckenberg, whether you start him at left or right tackle, is going to be a major, major component to keeping Tua Tunga Vailoa upright. I think they found four starters, all who have four who had first round grades for me. I did not think Holland or Eckenberg would have gone in the first round, so I don't want to say that they were falling and the Dolphins scooped them up. They were picked around where they were supposed to be picked, but I still just think that the Miami Dolphins nailed all four of those first picks that they had. And uh, they added a guy in Hunter Long, who's a nice tight end, too, to play behind Mike Kosicki. Uh Larnell Coleman is an absolute freak on the tackle side. Uh, he's a developmental piece, though. Hasn't been playing tackle for that long. Converted from defensive end, I believe. So he's necessarily not going to make an impact until maybe year three, year four uh, out of UMass. And then they get Jared Dokes. A running back reminds me a lot of Chris Carson in the second round. Who knows what type of impact he'll make. But specifically, those four, first four picks for the Miami Dolphins were absolutely out of the park. Not very often you can find four starters with four first-round grades in the first four picks of your draft. That's what the Miami Dolphins did, in my opinion. And don't be surprised if they have two strong candidates for both offensive and rookie, offensive and defensive rookie of the year in Jalen Waddell and Jalen Phillips. All right, that's going to do it for today's episode of the GSMC Sports Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I want to thank you all so much for listening to today's episode. Before I let you go, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast, leave us a five-star review, and follow us on all social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Again, thank you so much for tuning in today's episode, and I will see you all in the next one. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program